All right, it is good to see everybody this evening. We are studying the account tonight of God makes the sun stand still. Uh, the actual text of this, uh, the actual text of this lesson is uh, is in Joshua chapter ten, but uh, but we're going to deal uh, we're going to deal with uh, chapters nine and ten uh, because chapter nine is kind of required to set up the events of chapter ten. And so uh, the book of Joshua is uh, is uh, the first book following uh, the children of Israel entering into the promised land. It records the children of Israel uh, in their conquest of the promised land. Uh, it wasn't actually completed uh, during, there was still much to be done toward the end of Joshua, but uh, eventually they did uh, manage to conquer all the promised land as God had commanded them. But uh, so we think about, think about this particular account. Wait, I forgot to give you these. I'll set them over here and you can get them whenever you get to me. And you're already counting that I messed you up. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, let's just take a moment and, and build, kind of make our case from the beginning of Joshua up to chapter 9. Uh, most of these, uh, most of the Old Testament historical narratives, uh, all the chapters were divided over a thousand years after the Bible was written. Uh, 1,400 years for the chapters, and about 1,500 years for the verses. But uh, when the divisions were made in the various chapters, especially in the historical narratives, Joshua, uh, Judges, uh, Ruth not so much, but 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Samuel, uh, the chapter breaks follow various breaks in narrative, in other words, various events. And the first well, the first ten chapters, the first eight chapters, and then chapters nine and ten follow this pattern. For example, uh, in chapter one of the book of Joshua, you have uh, that God uh, reaffirms His covenant with uh, Israel. He uh, He uh, affirms His uh, His uh, His covenant with uh, with Joshua. You know, He He begins by intentionally goes, Moses, my servant, is dead. <laughs> it's like, but you're the man. You know, Moses is dead, but now you're the man. And God says, and don't you worry. I'll be with you just like I was with Moses. And that was a great statement of reassurance. And then in the end of that chapter, the entirety of the law, the entirety of the law is read to the Israelite people. In other words, joining, joining them and Joshua and the law all together. Then Joshua chapter 2 is the account of the spies being sent into Jericho. Uh, Joshua chapter three, uh, the people uh, the people begin to enter in uh, to the promised land. If you remember, though, they were supposed to go from from west to east, but when they failed to enter and believe Joshua and Caleb, they had to go through the forty years in the desert and come around and go from east to west, which means they had to cross the Jordan River. And God's priests bearing the ark came to the Jordan River, and God said, you follow them, but you follow them at a distance. He says, because you have never been this way before. I like that line. You've never been this way before. And so the priests stand in the river, and when their feet touch, touch the water, and by the way, that was the flood, the flood season of, of that part of the world. Jordan was, had overflowed its banks. The priests' feet touched the water, and just like Moses parted the Red Sea, and the people walked across on dry ground. The people, the waters parted when the priests hit the water. And the people walked across on dry ground. And the Bible says the water piled up. Piled up. They walked across on dry ground. God gave a command. Go into the middle of the river. Each, each tribe, get a stone and pile it up on the bank as a memorial. As, an, as, a, as a reminder of what God did for you at this place. Chapter 4 is the memorial stones. Chapter 5 is a circumcision that's practiced for the first time in 40 years. That all the, all the people who were alive that had entered into the wilderness, you know, everybody from tw you know 20 years and under that had gone into the wilderness, they'd all been circumcised. But none of their children had been circumcised. And by then, none of their children's children had been circumcised. So circumcision is reinstituted and practiced in chapter 5. Chapter 6, Jericho is destroyed. 
We all know the account. We all know the account of Jericho. Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is Israel's first defeat as they entered the promised land when they were defeated at Ai. Little town of Ai. Now the interesting thing about the, the account of Ai is <laughs> it's called a defeat and it was a defeat because they didn't take the city and, and I don't want to say this in any way that minimizes the human life but but they only lost 36 men in that defeat. They lost 36 men in that defeat. But they knew after what they had done to Jericho, that wasn't supposed to happen. And the key to that whole thing was is that a man by the name of Achan had disobeyed the Lord. God said, when you go into Jericho, every man goes, when the walls fall flat, you turn right into the city and you go straight in. And God said, don't you take any spoil of the city. The Bible says that a man named Achan took some Babylonian garments and a couple of wedges of silver and he hid them in his tent. And then they get ready to go to Ai. And Joshua and none of them, oh, Ai, you know, Ai. Well, Ai is about like Pierce's mill. It ain't very big. We don't, you know, we don't even need it. You know, let's just grab a few feathers and go down there and get it. What was the problem? There was sin in the camp. And they didn't, and they didn't inquire of the Lord. All they had done before they, before they went to Ai was just ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want us to do here? This is a tiny city. You want us to just gather up everybody and overwhelm them? Do we just want to send a thousand? What do you want us to do? But no inquiry was made of the Lord. And because of that, the children of Israel fled before their enemies and suffered a humiliating defeat. Now, keep that in mind of the defeat of Ai in chapter 7. Chapter 8, Ai is eventually destroyed. Uh, Achan, and his, uh, Achan and his family are, are eventually weeded out uh, before the people. Achan is uh, found to be guilty. He and his family and all of his goods are taken outside the camp. They're all stoned to death and piled up and burned. All right, that's chapter 8. Now we get to chapter 9. So chapter 7, the defeat of Ai. Chapter 8, the, the uh, conquering of Ai. And here we go to chapter 9. Now open your Bibles to chapter 9, look at verse 1. It says, It came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan, in the hills and the low land and in all the coasts of the great city toward London, the Hittite, Amorite, Canaanite, Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusite heard about it, that they gathered together to fight with Joshua and Israel with one accord. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. They took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old packed sandals on their feet, old garments, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua, to the camp of Gilgal, said to him, to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now therefore make a covenant with us. Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you dwell among us. How can we make a covenant with you? Verse 8. But they said to Joshua, We are your servants. And Joshua said, Who are you? And where do you come from? They said to him, from a very far country your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God, for we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt. Now mark that, mark that verse in your mind. We have heard of all that your God did in, in Egypt. We've heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt. And all that he did to the kings of the Amorites, between the Jordan, Sihon, king of Heshbon, Og, king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. Therefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say to them, We are your servants, now therefore make a covenant with us. This bread of ours, we took hot for our provision from our houses on the day we departed. And now look, it is dry and moldy. And these wineskins which we filled were new, and see, they are torn. These are garments and sandals have become old because of our very long journey. 
Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, verse 14, but they did not ask counsel from the Lord. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them, verse 16, and it happened after the end of three days after they had made a covenant with them that they heard that they were their neighbors who lived close to them. Verse 18, but the children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel and all the congregation complained against the rulers and the rulers said to the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. I want you to think about there are some key passages in this, in this precursor to the sun standing still. Now, there, are some th there are some things that we see. Number one is, a key concept is, they heard or we have heard. All right, now, the kings of the kings of, uh, 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 of of the Canaanites, they heard what had happened to Jericho and Ai. But what did the Gibeonites say they had heard? We heard the fame of the Lord your God and all that He did where in Egypt. In Egypt, let me ask you a question. How far, how far away was Egypt? That was a long way, right? And not only was it a long way, but let me ask you this. How long ago had that happened? At least how many years? At least 40, right? Because God had led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And there were, obviously there was some period of time before they disobeyed the Lord. I mean, those 40 days that the spies were in Canaan, there was Moses 40 days on the mount getting the law. But, but you know, if we just wanted to round it up, it's at least 40 years. 40 years have gone by, and the people of Gideon still remember what God did in Egypt. By the way, in Joshua chapter 2, when the two spies were sent into Jericho, and to the house of Rahab. Do you remember what she said? She said, when we heard that you were coming, our hearts melted because we knew what your God had done in Egypt. Again, 40 years, hundreds of miles, you know, no, you know, no Fox News, you know, no internet, you know, no newspapers. Forty years has gone by, and the people of Jericho still remember what God did in Egypt. And here we are with the Gibeonites, and the Gibeonites, forty years later, still remember, still remember what God did in Egypt. So that's one thing we want to remember about this. The great works of God will not be unnoticed, and they will not be forgotten. They will not be forgotten. But then secondly, the key phrase in verse 14, they did not ask counsel. They did not ask counsel from the Lord. So now we come to chapter 10. And the kings of Canaan have decided that they're going to get a jump on Israel and what they're going to do is they're going to attack Gideon. They said Gideon is a large, powerful city. It's a royal city. It's an important city. And so we're going to get to jump on Israel by attacking Gideon rather than attacking Israel. He said, because they've made a covenant. They've made a covenant with them. In other words, the friend of my enemy is also my enemy. You see, the Gibeonites, the Gibeonites were not their enemy. But because the Gibeonites were in, in league with Israel, that made them the enemy of the people of the land of Canaan. And so, and so these are some things that we have to remember. Now, here come the kings of Canaan. 
They come to make war against Gideon, and Gideon sends word to Israel, said, you got to come help us. <laughs> they come coming after us. You, got, you, you, you made a covenant with us. you got to come help us. So Joshua gathers up the army, goes to, 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 help, to help Gideon, and the Bible says in verse number 7, so Joshua, this is chapter 10 now, Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor, men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. And the Lord routed them before Israel and killed them with a great slaughter at Gideon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Haran, struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. And as it happened, as they fled before Israel and were on the descent to Beth Haran, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones then Israel killed with the sword. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon and move in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And so we see that God's people, in keeping with their covenant, go to the assistance of the Gibeonites, and God helps them. God helps them. In fact, the Bible says not only did he help them in their in their physical, in their physical battle. He helped them by dropping hailstones out of heaven on them. And by, can you imagine what that must have been like? Because you know, you know, we think about you know, some of us, in, even in recent days, we've seen some pretty bad hailstorms, right? I mean, we've seen a lot of hail in this area. Yeah. Uh, my cousin was just telling me he lost about half of 80 acres of cotton due to the hailstorm last week. But can you imagine hailstones falling out of heaven? And, here, and here's what I imagine. God ain't missing with none of his. You know, he ain't just raining hailstones like we see hail, and, you know, and ten of them fall to the ground, and one of them hits somebody. I just see God smoking them one by one. Ain't a hailstone hitting the ground, not a one of them. You know, God got good angels. And he's, he's, ha he's, hammering these, he's hammering these Canaanites with hailstones. And, and however many thousands fell by the hand of the storm, a sword, even more fell because of the hailstones that fell. Now, I want y'all to think about this. Joshua wanted the sun to stand still, right? Now, I want you to think about maybe, what might be some reasons behind that. Right, well, you know, what, for example, what might happen if the sun went down? Battle stops. And if the battle stops, what happens? And, and, what, and what happens to the Canaanites? They get away. They get away. You know, they're not going to, you know, you know, when they're getting their tails kicked like that and, 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 and the sun goes down, if the battle stops, they're not going to rest until, until they get out of Dodge, right? And you can't, you, know, you can't pursue people at night in, in that, those types of conditions. And so the sun stands still, number one, to extend the amount of time that Joshua and his people had to, to take vengeance on their enemies. But also think about this. What did we say that Joshua had done the previous day? But how did he get, what it said, he came down from Gilgal, what did it say? He marched what? All night. He done marched all night. And then he done been fighting all day. You know, 
this, you know, this, this was not, this was not, you know, yeah. the momentum was in their direction. This was not the time to rest. You know, you know, these, as I said, you know, these guys had everything going their way, and they needed to keep on fighting as long, as long as they could. And so, you know, there are a lot of, while, while I'm talking about this, you know, there's, there's a lot of little details in here that if you think about them, it all seems, you know, comes, comes together and makes sense. But I want to think about some things. I want to think about some things, uh, um, well, four things about this text and this particular thing. And one of them we've already talked about to some extent, and that is that, you know, the works of the Lord cannot be concealed. The works of the Lord cannot be concealed. The people in Jericho remembered what happened in Egypt 40 years later. The people, you know, the people in uh, uh, the people in Gibeon remembered what happened in Egypt 40 years later. You know, in other words, when the Lord does great things, word gets around. Word gets around. Think about this. When Jonah, when Jonah went to Nineveh after. <coughs> Got to ride around for three days in a fish. He goes into Nineveh and preaches an eight word sermon in a city that probably had close to a million people in it. Have you ever thought about that? A total stranger walks into a city of a million people and says, Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was the extent of his sermon. And what happened? They all repented from the king all the way down. Listen, they even wanted the Lord, they, they wanted the Lord to know about their repentance so much they made their animals repent. They put sackcloth and ashes on their own animals. You know, just in case the Lord, just in case the Lord doesn't understand how sorry we are. Look at our animals. Our animals are covered in sackcloth and ashes. But how do you get an eight-word sermon and a response like that? What, what, what might have brought on that kind of response? How about this? You think word might have got back about a man got swallowed by a fish? <coughs> you think word might have got out about a man you know, by somebody on the coastline? And they seen a fish vomiting a man out, vomiting a man out on the beach. And that man gets up, starts walking toward them. You know, word gets around, y'all. I mean, what did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5, 13. You know, you're the salt of the earth. In verse 14. But you're also a city set on a hill. You know, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When we're doing the work of the Lord, we don't have to tell people about it. We don't have to tell people. People will see it. When we're doing what the Lord wants us to do, people will see it. You know, we don't have to broadcast it. We don't have to advertise it. You know, we don't have to take selfies of ourselves doing the Lord's work. You know, people will notice. The works of the Lord cannot be concealed. Number two is this. The counsel of the Lord must always be sought. The counsel of the Lord must always be sought. Here we are in chapter 9, and they're not seeking the counsel of the Lord when they had just got 36 men killed and embarrassed in front of their enemies for the very same reason. Don't you think, don't you think somebody could at some point would have thought, you know what? We don't know if these dudes are telling the truth or not. If we only had some way to know. If we only had some way, we do this all the time. I eat breakfast with a bunch of old dudes like Steve Miller every day down at the Chevron. And we sit around the table and we talk. And, and Steve will tell you, this is, this is the truth. This happens at least once a week. We'll be talking about something. And we'll be talking about some historical figure, some sports figure, some ball game. And we'll all be sitting there trying to discuss. Now, was that in 72 did they play that game in 72 or was that 73? And invariably, here's what I'll say. If we only had some way of finding out. You know, 
There's no need to argue over trivia anymore, is there? The magic box has the answers. There's always a way to find... Right, I mean, is there anything that you can't find out trivia-wise from the magic box? No. Well, was there anything that Joshua couldn't know if he needed to know? Now, he didn't have the magic box. He had something better, didn't he? They had just made the mistake of not inquiring at the Lord. <coughs> they already were under suspicion of the Gideonites that they might not be who they said they were. And all it would have taken was 15 seconds of prayer. Right? How long, how long would it have taken? How long would it have taken Joshua to say, hey y'all, wait right here. I'll be right back. And walk over around behind the tent and say, Lord, are these people telling me the truth or are they lying? How long do you think it took him to get an answer? Well, he'd got one right on the spot, wouldn't he? God would have told him right there, right there, them guys are from on the other side of the hill. They lying. Do not make a covenant with them. They're liars. They did. So sometimes we repeat our own, we repeat our own mistakes in short order after we've already just just committed. The counsel of the Lord must always be sought. You know, look, it's great. It's great for churches to make plans. They need to make plans. They need to look to the future, a year, five years, ten years down the road. But we don't need to be making any plans without asking for the counsel of the Lord. I mean, doesn't James chapter 1 promise us that any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not? Does, does the Bible say that or not? It does. But the question is, do we believe it or not? Do you believe God will give you wisdom if you pray for it? Do you believe God will give you guidance if you pray for it? It reminds me of a friend of mine. We were out one day running and uh, he's, a, he's a member of a denomination. And at that time, he was a deacon in that denomination. And he was in the deacon's meeting. And I'm not saying this to, to defend what they're doing, but what he said is oftentimes indicative of what we are guilty of doing. He's sitting here in this deacon's meeting, and all these deacons have all these grand ideas about what they're going to do. You know, Bill's and Grounds deacon, oh man, he's got big plans. And the youth deacon, he's got big plans. And the music deacon, he's got big plans. And the mission deacon, He's got big plans, and man, they're just going great guns. They're just, they're just piling plans on top of plans on top of plans. And here's what my friend said. He said, fellas, he said, I think we're making a mistake here. He said, we've brought all these plans in here, all the things that we want to do, all the things that we intend to do, and we have not spent five seconds asking the Lord if this is what he wants us to do. Now, can we be guilty of the same thing? Look, I'm not saying the Lord is going to be efficacious to, to a group of denominational deacons, but the principle's still the same. The principle's the same. And here's what he did. And, and if that didn't make him mad enough, here's what he chased it with. So instead of asking the Lord what he wants us to do, we're telling the Lord what we're going to do and asking him to bless it. How often do we make that mistake? The counsel of the Lord must always be sought. And by the, way, the counsel of the Lord must always be sought first. <laughs> and not the financial statement. Yep. The first question in, any, in anything the church wants to undertake should not be, how much money do we have? The first question is, is it something that God wants us to do? Are we authorized to do it? Is it something that we need to do? Then once we answer those questions, then we can move on to the financial statement, whether, we got, whether or not we got the financial means or the, and or the manpower to get it done. But sometimes we'll still let those two things override the first two. We don't, we don't have enough faith. You know, I'm not saying we need to go out and build a Taj Mahal somewhere. You know, how, you know, how often do we make plans and we don't, we don't consult the Lord? We'll spend five seconds consulting the Lord. We'll spend five seconds you know, uh, asking, you know, asking the Lord for wisdom and guidance in these things. 
uh, you know, uh, David did the same thing when he carried the ark on an ox cart. Remember what happened there? Uzzah touched the ark, got killed, you know, got killed dead, as we might say. When you read the Chronicles account, the first Chronicles 15, 13, it says, God made a breach against us because we did not seek him after the due order. There was no need to us of getting killed. All they had to do was open up the word of God and find out how to move that order. That's seeking the counsel of the Lord. And so not just seeking the counsel of the Lord in prayer, seeking the counsel of the Lord in his book. Number three, we've got to be willing to suffer the consequences of the vows that we make. Israel made some foolish vows, but they had to and they had to suffer the consequences of it. By the way, do we have any other Bible accounts of people making bad vows? Should I mention Jephthah to you? In Judges chapter 11, who vowed that if, he deli if God delivered his enemies into his hand, he'd sacrifice the first thing that came out of his house. Does anybody remember what the first thing that came out of his house was? His daughter. And the Bible says he kept his vow. You know, Psalm 15, 1 to 4. You know, Who shall ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who shall dwell in his holy hill? And one of the qualifications of that is he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. We've got to be people of our word. Now listen, I give Joshua and them all the credit in the world. They made a mistake, but they stood by their word. We made a vow to the Lord. And it was a foolish vow, but we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it. You know, I, I promise some women have done that at the marriage altar. Made a foolish vow. <laughs> but, but they got to keep it. You get on down the road a little way. Now, don't ask my wife if she did it. All right? You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes people make bad marriage vows, right? They make a bad choice. Still got to keep the vow. That's the Bible that you make to the Lord. And then lastly this. God will help us even when we're suffering the consequences of our own actions. See, Israel was having to fight the Canaanites to defend Gideon because of an ill-conceived covenant. But God didn't say, well, you made the bed, now lie in it. That's not what he did, was it? They had integrity enough to keep their covenant and go out and do what they said they'd do by the name of God, and God helped them. God helped them. By the way, the entire book of Judges is filled. Is that one or two? The way some of y'all jumped, I should have known it was one. I know. Give about two minutes and read it again. with God helping his people even after they end up in a mess due to their own doing. God helped David even though his whole rest of his life was in a mess because of his sin with Bathsheba. Read 2 Samuel 12. There are a bunch of things that are going bad that going to happen to David. The sword will never depart from your house. He had four kids. He had four kids to die after that. Alright? All of them died violent deaths. Right? But God still helped David. Right? David made a number of trans errors. You know, David numbered the people in 2 Samuel 24, and God was angry with him. But God was still merciful to him. Notice, God, God will still help us even when we're suffering the consequences of our own, our own bad decisions uh, and, and our mistakes. I thought about this. I, I'll close with this. God helped Paul go to Rome. Even though he warned him everywhere he went not to go to Jerusalem. Have you ever read how many times Paul was warned by the Holy Spirit not to go to Jerusalem? Acts 20, 22 to 24. They told him by the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. Acts 21, Agabus the prophet said, Paul, by the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. Acts 21, 10, by the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. Over and over and over again, Paul was warned by the Holy Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. And what did Paul do? He went to Jerusalem. And everything that Agabus said would happen.
happened to him happened to him just like that. But did God say, well, Paul, you made your bed, now I'm lying. No. God helped Paul. Helped him through, uh, helped him through that little boy that overheard the conspiracy against him. Help him, you know, help him through the course of that, that shipwreck and being adrift in the sea. Helped him at Malta. Helped him on his way to Rome. God will still help us if we seek his help, even when we're suffering the consequences of our own bad, our own bad decisions. All right.